the gale by richard henry dana jr this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the gale by richard henry dana jr read by bill mosley frelsberg texas we were now off Point Conception, the Cape Horn of California, where the sailors say it begins to blow the first of January and blows until the last of December. Toward the latter part of the afternoon, however, the regular northwest wind, as usual, set in, which brought in our studding sails and gave us the chance of beating round the point which we were now just abreast of, and which stretched off into the Pacific, high, rocky, and barren, forming the central point of the coast for hundreds of miles north and south. A cap full of wind will be a bag full here. Before night our royals were furled, and the ship was laboring hard under her top-gallant sails. At eight bells our watch went below, leaving her with as much sail as she could stagger under, the water flying over the forecastle at every plunge. It was evidently blowing harder, but then there was not a cloud in the sky, and the sun had gone down bright. We had been below but a short time before we had the usual premonitions of a coming gale, seas washing over the whole forward part of the vessel, and her bows beating against them with a force and sound like the driving of piles. The watch, too, seemed very busy trampling about decks and singing out at the ropes. A sailor can tell by the sound what sail is coming in, and in a short time we heard the topgallant sails come in, one after another, and then the flying jib. This seemed to ease her a good deal, and we were fast going off to the land of Nod when bang, bang, bang on the scuttle, and all hands reef topsails ahoy started us out of our berths, and it not being very cold weather, we had nothing extra to put on, and were soon on deck. I shall never forget the fineness of the sight. It was a clear and rather a chilly night. The stars were twinkling with an intense brightness, and as far as the eye could reach, there was not a cloud to be seen. The horizon met the sea in a defined line. A painter could not have painted so clear a sky. There was not a speck upon it. Yet it was blowing great guns from the northwest. When you can see a cloud to windward, you feel that there is a place for the wind to come from. But here it seemed to come from nowhere. No person could have told from the heavens, by their eyesight alone, that it was not a still summer's night. One reef after another we took in the topsails, and before we could get them hoisted up, we heard a sound like a short, quick rattling of thunder, and the jib was blown to atoms out of the bolt rope. We got the topsail set and the fragments of the jib stowed away, and the fore topmast staysail set in its place, when the great mainsail gaped open and the sail ripped from head to foot. Lay up on that main yard and furl the sail before it blows to tatters, shouted the captain. And in a moment we were up, gathering the remains of it upon the yard. We got it wrapped around the yard and passed gaskets over it as snugly as possible. And were just on deck again, when, with another loud rent which was heard throughout the ship, the fore topsail, which had been double reefed, split in two athwart ships just below the reef band, from earring to earring. Here again it was, down yard, haul out reef tackles, and lay out upon the yard for reefing. 
by hauling the reef tackles chock-a-block we took the strain from the other earrings and passing the close reefed earring and knotting the points carefully we succeeded in setting the sail close reefed we had but just got the rigging coiled up and were waiting to hear go below the watch when the main royal worked loose from the gaskets and blew directly out to leeward flapping and shaking the mast like a wand here was a job for somebody but royal must come in or be cut adrift or the mast would be snapped short off all the light hands and the starboard watch were sent up one after another but they could do nothing with them at length john the tall frenchman the head of the starboard watch and a better sailor never stepped upon a deck sprang aloft and by the help of his long arms and legs succeeded after a hard struggle the sail blowing over the yard arm to leeward and the sky sail adrift directly over his head in smothering it and frapping it with long pieces of sennit he came very near being blown or shaken from the yard several times but he was a true sailor every finger a fish hook having made the sail snug he prepared to send the yard down which was a long and difficult job for frequently he was obliged to stop and hold on with all his might for several minutes the ship pitching so as to make it impossible to do anything else at that height the yard at length came down safe and after it the fore and mids and royal yards were sent down all hands were then set aloft and for an hour or two we were hard at work making the booms well fast unreeving the studding sail and royal and sky sail gear getting rolling ropes on the yard setting up the weather breast backstays and making other preparations for a storm it was a fine night for a gale just cool and bracing enough for quick work without being cold and as bright as day it was sport to have a gale in such weather as this yet it blew like a hurricane the wind seemed to come with a spite an edge to it which threatened to scrape us off the yards the force of the wind was greater than i had ever felt it before but darkness cold and wet are the worst parts of a storm to a sailor having got on deck again we looked round to see what time of night it was and whose watch in a few minutes the man at the wheel struck four bells and we found that the other watch was out and our own half out accordingly the starboard watch went below and left the ship to us for a couple of hours yet with orders to stand by for a call hardly had they got below before away went the fore topmast staysail blown to ribbons this was a small sail which we could manage in the watch so that we were not obliged to call up the other watch we laid out upon the bowsprit where we were under water half the time and took in the fragments of the sail and as she must have some head sail on her prepared to bend another stay sail we got the new one out into the nettings seized on the tack sheets and halyards and the hanks manned the halyards cut adrift the frapping lines and hoisted away but before it was halfway up the stay it was blown all to pieces when we belayed the halyards there was nothing left but the bolt rope now large eyes began to show themselves in the foresail and knowing that it must soon go the mate ordered us upon the yard to furl it being unwilling to call up the watch who had been on deck all night he roused out the carpenter sailmaker cook and steward and with their help we manned the foreyard and after nearly half an hour's struggle mastered the sail got it well furled round the yard the force of the wind had never been greater than at this moment in going up the rigging it seemed absolutely to pin us down to the shrouds 
and on the yard there was no such thing as turning a face to windward. Yet here was no driving sleet, and darkness and wet and cold as off Cape Horn, and instead of stiff oilcloth suits, sou'wester caps and thick boots, we had on hats, round jackets, duck trousers, light shoes, and everything light and easy. These things make a great difference to a sailor. When we got on deck, the man at the wheel struck eight bells, four o'clock in the morning, and all Starbolans ahoy brought the other watch up, but there was no going below for us. The gale was now at its height, blowing like scissors and thumbscrews. The captain was on deck. The ship, which was light, rolling and pitching as though she would shake the long sticks out of her, and the sails were gaping open and splitting in every direction. The mizzen topsail, which was a comparatively new sail and close reefed, split from head to foot in the bunt. The fore topsail went in one rent from clue to earring and was blowing to tatters. One of the chain bobstays parted. The sprit sail yard sprung in the slings. The martingale had slewed away off to leeward, and owing to the long dry weather, the lee rigging hung in large bites at every lurch. One of the main top gallant shrouds had parted, and to crown all, the galley had got adrift, had gone over to leeward, and the anchor on the lee bow had worked loose and was thumping the side. Here was work enough for all hands for half a day. Our gang laid out on the mizzen topsail yard, and after more than half an hour's hard work, furled the sail, though it bellied out over our heads, and again, by a slat of the wind, blew in under the yard with a fearful jerk, and almost threw us off from the foot ropes. Double gaskets were passed round the yards, rolling tackles and other gear bows taut, and everything made as secure as it could be. Coming down, we found the rest of the crew just coming down the fore rigging, having furled the tattered topsail, or rather swathed it round the yard, which looked like a broken limb bandaged. There was no sail now on the ship, but the spanker and the close-reefed main topsail, which still held good. But this was too much after sail, and order was given to furl the spanker. The brails were hauled up, all the light hands in the starboard watch sent out on the gaff to pass the gaskets, but they could do nothing with it. The second mate swore at them for a parcel of soggers and sent up a couple of the best men, but they could do no better, and the gaff was lowered down. All hands were now employed in setting up the lee rigging, fishing the spritsail yard, lashing the galley, and getting tackles upon the martingale to bows it to windward. Being in the larboard watch, my duty was forward, to assist in setting up the martingale. Three of us were out on the martingale guys and back ropes for more than half an hour, carrying out, hooking and unhooking the tackles, several times buried in the seas, until the mate ordered us in from fear of our being washed off. The anchors were then to be taken up on the rail, which kept all hands on the forecastle for an hour, though every now and then the seas broke over it, washing the rigging off to leeward, filling the lee scuppers breast high, and washing chalk aft to the taffrail. Having got everything secure again, we were promising ourselves some breakfast, for it was now nearly nine o'clock in the forenoon, when the main topsail showed evident signs of giving way. Some sail must be kept on the ship, and the captain ordered the fore and main spencer gaffs to be lowered down, and the two spencers, which were storm sails, brand new, small, and made of the strongest canvas, to be got up and bent, leaving the main topsail to blow away with a blessing on it, if it would only last until we could set the spencers. 
These we bent on very carefully, with strong robins and sizings, and, making tackles fast to the clues, bows them down to the waterways. By this time the main topsail was among the things that have been. We went aloft to stow away the remnant of the last sail of all those which were on the ship twenty-four hours before. The spencers were now the only whole sails on the ship, and being strong and small and near the deck, presenting but little surface to the wind above the rail, promised to hold out well. Hove to under these, and eased by having no sail above the tops, the ship rose and fell, and drifted off to leeward like a line of battleship. It was now eleven o'clock, and the watch was sent below to get breakfast. And at eight bells, noon, as everything was snug, although the gale had not in the least abated, the watch was set, and the other watch and idlers sent below. For three days and three nights the gale continued with unabated fury and with singular regularity. There were no lulls, and very little variation in its fierceness. Our ship, being light, rolled so as almost to send the fore yard arm under water, and drifted off bodily to leeward. All this time there was not a cloud to be seen in the sky, day or night. No, not so large as a man's hand. Every morning the sun rose cloudless from the sea, and set again at night in the sea in a flood of light. The stars, too, came out of the blue one after another, night after night, unobscured, and twinkled as clear as on a still frosty night at home until the day came upon them. All this time the sea was rolling in immense surges, white with foam, as far as the eye could reach, on every side, for we were now leagues and leagues from shore. The between decks being empty, several of us slept there in hammocks, which are the best things in the world to sleep in during a storm, it not being true of them, as it is of another kind of bed, when the wind blows the cradle will rock, for it is the ship that rocks, while they hang vertically from the beam. During these seventy-two hours we had nothing to do but to turn in and out, four hours on deck, four below, eat, sleep, and keep watch. The watches were only varied by taking the helm in turn, and now and then by one of the sails, which were furled, blowing out of the gaskets, and getting adrift, which sent us up on the yards, and by getting tackles on different parts of the rigging, which were slack. Once the wheel rope parted, which might have been fatal to us, had not the chief mate sprung instantly with a relieving tackle to windward, and kept the tiller up till a new rope could be rowed. On the morning of the 20th, at daybreak, the gale had evidently done its worst, and had somewhat abated, so much so that all hands were called to bend new sails, although it was still blowing as hard as two common gales. One at a time, with great difficulty and labor, the old sails were unbent and sent down by the bunt lines, and three new topsails made for the homeward passage around Cape Horn, which had never been bent, were got up from the sail room and, under the care of the sailmaker, were fitted for bending and sent up by the halyards into the tops, and with stops and frapping lines were bent to the yards close reefed, sheeted home, and hoisted. These were bent one at a time, and with the greatest care and difficulty. Two spare courses were then got up, and bent on the same manner and furled, and a storm jib, with the bonnet off, bent and furled to the boom. It was twelve o'clock before we got through, and five hours of more exhausting labor I never experienced. 
no one of that ship's crew, I will venture to say, will ever desire again to unbend and bend five large sails in the teeth of a tremendous nor'wester. Towards night a few clouds appeared on the horizon, and as the gale moderated, the usual appearance of driving clouds relieved the face of the sky. The fifth day after the commencement of the storm, we shook a reef out of each topsail and set the reefed foresail, jib, and spanker. But it was not until after eight days of reefed topsails that we had a whole sail on the ship. And then it was quite soon enough, for the captain was anxious to make up for leeway, the gale having blown us half the distance to the Sandwich Islands. Inch by inch, as fast as the gale would permit, we made sail on the ship, for the wind still continued ahead, and we had many days sailing to get back to the longitude we were in when the storm took us. For eight days more we beat to windward, under a stiff, top-gallant breeze, when the wind shifted and became variable. A light sou'easter, to which we could carry a reef topmast studding sail, did wonders for our dead reckoning. Friday, December 4th, after a passage of twenty days, we arrived at the mouth of the Bay of San Francisco. End of The Gale by Richard Henry Dana, Jr. Recorded by Bill Mosley, Prellsburg, Texas.